All right, folks, we are live. If you're tuning in on the replay, thank you so much for being here. It's been really cool recently to see how many people are tuning in to these episodes on the replay. Um, we do them at five o'clock UK time typically, so we can try and hit the US market as well as people finishing their day here in sunny Britain or wherever you currently are. I'm just doing a check to make sure we are working. And I can hear myself, which is good. If you are tuning in on the replay, please drop a comment with hashtag replay. Tell me where you're listening from. It is always much appreciated. And I don't mind whether you're listening to the replay a week later, a day later, an hour later. Just let me know where you're listening from. Like I say, we're getting some unique places from the Shetland Islands to Florida to Ireland worldwide worldwide which is awesome if you're tuning in live i can see people are coming in facebook linkedin youtube periscope tell me where you're listening from drop a comment say hello this is going to be a good show guys this is going to be a really really good show uh this is somebody i've worked with personally it's somebody that i admire in what they do and i'm very excited to bring their bring their goodness to the ears and the eyes of you this evening um, if you cannot make it for the whole show, like I just said, there's going to be a replay, so you can check that out on the platform that you're watching this on right now. Or you can head over to podcasts on your favorite podcast and platform. Just type in Funnels and Business Growth Show. This show will be going out in a few weeks' time, but you can uh, listen to all the previous episodes until we get to that one. Awesome. We've got someone from Shetland. We've got someone from Coventry. We have someone from Kent. So it's all the UK people that are repping tonight. Someone, someone in the US, someone in Canada, someone somewhere else in Europe, drop us a comment. Do us proud. We've got Manchester, Essex. Oh, it's all the UK people this evening. Come on. <laughs> Come on, everybody else. Maybe you're, you're too excited in the, in the US election. Folks, I'm going to get this party started. I am going to hit record, do the introduction, and bring this amazing person onto the screen. So I hope you're ready for this. A little bit rusty. I was on holiday last week, so I I haven't done this intro in a while. Let's see. Let's hope that I can get my timing right today. Hey, you are listening to the Funnels and Growth Show. My name is Gavin Bell, and I've discovered a little bit of a problem. You see, too many entrepreneurs act great at what they do, but they never see true growth. All too often, they rely on luck, hustle, and hope to grow, which, as you probably know, is not the best marketing strategy. So in this show, I aim to uncover the secrets around creating a marketing system that allows you to build your audience, generate more leads, and acquire customers at a profit. Now, on today's show, you have somebody that is amazing with words. And I mean amazing with words. You know, in the online world, we often like to launch new products and services. And we do that launch thing to build excitement, to generate as many sales as we can in a short amount of time. And today I've got a copywriter that works with digital-based entrepreneurs specifically on their launch copy. So they can help people get make more sales, impact more people, and get more freedom in their everyday lives, which is something that I am all about. It's all about freedom. It's all about living a, a good life on this show. She's led many business owners to six-figure launches, and she believes that connecting with readers through the words that you write is what truly can take your funnel to new heights. I am excited to have her here. So I want you guys just to go absolutely mental as I bring on Danny Page to the Funnels and Growth Show. Yay, hey Gavin. How are you, Danny? I'm wonderful. How are you doing? I am fantastic. I'm, you know, we spoke off air there about the a little bit about the U.S. election. It's one of those weeks where, for those of you who are listening to this, we are recording in U.S. election week. It's been a funny old week because I've just been trying to work, but also spending far too much time just refreshing Twitter and seeing no further results come in. Don't know about you over there, but um, that's that's the week I'm living. Yeah, it's funny. We're we're like the I'm in Canada, so I'm Canadian. So we're like I feel like we're the little sister, little brother, like just cheering them on, rooting them on. So yeah, we're got your back, that's for sure. US. Canadians are so nice. You guys are just like, <laughs> yeah, well, you make the right decision for you guys. We hope you do. We hope you you do what's best. We'll just follow like usual, right? <laughs> I love it. Danny, it's amazing to have you here. Um, we worked together back in well, maybe August, September time that we launched together when we were running a five-day challenge. For those of you that are listening might remember, we spoke about a five-day challenge back then. Well, Danny actually helped with the launch of that. And that turned out to be a $30,000 $30, launch, which was awesome. 
And I brought Danny on to, I'm getting all my words mixed up. It's been a while since I've done one of these. I brought Danny on to audit our existing sales page. So we've done two five-day challenges now. We, had, we did one in June. We did one in September. Brought Danny on to audit our sales page from the June launch. And, you know, she completely changed what we were doing, which resulted in, you know, awesome results coming in. And I, you know, when I was looking at who to bring on the show, I was like, I have to bring Danny on because she evidently knows what she's doing. We've worked with her. And I know that for those of you that are listening, you're going to love everything that she says. So Danny, I guess let's start off with the audit. Like when you're auditing a sales page, which is something I'm sure you do a lot of, what are some of the top mistakes that people are making on sales pages? Yeah, for sure. Awesome question. I absolutely love looking at sales pages. I have done so many of them. So lots of great, not great, but lots of common mistakes I can let you know about. So first one, and I see it so much, is that there's no rapport being built on your sales page. So you know how like the first one third of the sales page talks about the problem? And it's great that you're digging into the problem and like twisting the knife, as I say, a little bit. But you really also need to connect that to like your experience and why I should be listening to you. You really need to do this to build that trust. So are you telling me about this problem because you went through it too and overcame it? Or maybe you have clients that have had this problem and you've helped hundreds of people solve it. You really need to explain the problem, but also attach it to why you're the expert and why you know, I should be listening to you. So you, this helps just build a rapport and build trust with your readers, especially in that top third of the page. Awesome. So when it, I mean, that kind of leads me into a question that I wanted to ask you around is, you know, when I, when I read your copy, so specifically your copy, I'm like, there's something different about your copy to everybody else's. You know, when I look through your website or your Instagram or your Facebook or whatever it might be, I'm like, there's something different about it it's like it's almost like i actually want to read it which sounds weird but you know when you know as humans or maybe it's just me because i have the attention span of a goldfish when i see text <laughs> online even though it might be like the most interesting thing or most valuable thing out there i'm like i just don't want to read it i just don't have the you know the capacity in my brain to read that paragraph but when i go on your website like I just want to read everything because, and I don't know what it is. I think it's like it's entertaining or you're showing personality, but I guess yeah. what you're doing is you're, is you're building rapport with me via text. So that's exactly it. So how are you doing that? Yeah, it's thank you for those lovely um, comments. I'm bringing, I bring a lot of personality into my writing. I truly do. I bring my voice into everything I say. And, you know, people say it all the time, like you really want to write like you're having a conversation, like you and I are just sitting down over a drink, beer or coffee sort of thing. So I really bring that to like the 10th degree in my copy. Um, no one likes reading boring copy. Like I'm going to say what people are thinking. I, uh, you know, like I have a sales page going right now, for, uh, for example, and I actually call out the urgency line right in my sales page. And I say like, oh, this is where I'm supposed to put in urgency, right? Because I market to marketers. So they know what I'm doing. They know I'm trying to sell to them. So yeah, I like being very honest, very um, out there and just bringing in my personality into everything I write. So when you do that, is that something that you are, that you've trained yourself to be able to do by just trying it? Or is it something that you let like you actually are conscious and focus on trying to do, if that makes sense. Yeah, I am conscious about it. I, I personally, as a consumer, don't like reading boring copy. So why should I write it for others? So I like writing things that I would enjoy reading myself, I guess. Yeah, because, you know, when I come to write, so like I, I would class myself as a relatively fun guy. And for those of people that know me personally will know that I'm, you know, a bit stupid and I like to have a lot of fun. I don't know what it is. When I come and sit down to write copy, sometimes I can, and I'm getting better at this, sometimes the copy I write is, you know, I was writing an about page for a new agency brand we're about to launch, and God, it's so boring. So for you, is this is this something that, like, you know, when you're sitting down to write some copy, whether it's a sales page or a page on your site, are, are you just naturally able to get your personality across, or will you write something and then go, hmm, that needs a little bit more personality? Yeah. The second one. Um, so I usually write it, I put down what I want to say, like I know the point of what I'm writing. 
Um, so I get that down and it's usually fairly flat, but then I come back in and just layer the personality. I look at some words. How can I like change how this word looks or, you know, maybe spell it differently or just try to add my personality in. So I get what I want to say first and foremost, like you always need to make sure it's clear, always clear over clever. Uh, and then I come back and try to add in that personality. Okay, cool. That makes me feel a little bit better. About myself then. <laughs> but wh when is like personality too much? You know, yeah. Like, and okay. and Sorry, it's a fine line for sure. The reason I ask that question is because we were recently writing a page for a, uh, a job that we're hiring for. And, and I was like, I want to add, I'm going to, I'm going to add personality here. I'm going to be super cool uh, down with the kids. And um, <laughs> I started writing the personality, but then this like inner voice in my head was like, hmm, but then you're not going to be taken seriously. So when is personality, like when is too much personality too much, if that makes sense? Or it, it does. Or do you feel that you should just be yourself and you will attract the right people? Like I know there's people that are on both sides of that coin. Yeah, and I, I do agree that it's a fine line. One thing to think about is the type of, so say we're talking about emails for existent, for example, the type of email you're writing, if it's a story-based email and it's not really a hard sell, maybe you've got like a blog that you're linking to, feel free to bring in more personality. The closer you get to like a deadline email, it's definitely more serious. You're not going to be like completely crazy. You can still add in that personality, but definitely the tone does change on like a last call urgency email as opposed to a very beginning. Yay, doors are open um, where it's a little bit more relaxed. So that's definitely one thing to consider. Um, and then also, I mean, it, it comes back to the gut thing. Reread it. And if it doesn't feel good, I, I wouldn't put it out, right? You need to be confident in what you're saying. Um, and it really does always go back to that clear over clever. If you're thinking it's a little bit too much, I would pull it. I would rather just get my point across than be um, have someone just be completely turned off. Of, if for me, like completely turned off or trying to be funny, you know, that's never going to win anyone. Yeah, totally. I, I think that's uh, I think that's probably the fear that um, maybe I have in that example. But I, I certainly think this is a universal problem. Just getting personality across, especially, you know, I, I I feel like business and the types of people that we work with, you know, this more like digital entrepreneurial type person. I think I think there's definitely a a movement towards trying to be more authentic and being more vulnerable and being more in your more yourself and i think um i think it's and first of all i think it's important that we all do that but i think there's people are starting to understand that that's an important part of their marketing and, and their branding but i still i think a lot of people do have that problem when it comes to getting their personality across so i think that uh, a couple of things that i've taken from that is like the clear over clever is definitely something to think about um but i also love this idea of just writing what that point you know, first of all, understanding what the point is that you're trying to get across, then writing it and then going back over it. And, you know, how can I make this a little bit funner? Yeah, how can I make this a little bit more like it's us having a conversation over a coffee or a beer as opposed to, you know, a corporate serious about page on my website to tell people our corporate structure. Yeah, exactly. So I love that. That's awesome. So I mean, yeah, the personality side of things. I love it when it comes to creating or writing a sales page, Danny, do you have like a, a structure that you use? So you spoke about there, the first third of a page should be about problems. What, what's the, what's the other two thirds look like? Yeah. So the first third of the sales page, like you said, it's more like the marketing and the second two thirds of the page is more the selling, right? So the second half is really when we get into explaining the our actual offer, the features, the benefits, you know, the FAQs, the guarantee, and that, you know, second, um, you know, the bottom half of the sales page definitely has more structure. It's a little bit more, um, uh, yeah, it's, it's a, definitely a lot more structured, whereas the first half is more specific to your problem, your avatar. So um, yeah, the second half is definitely a little bit easier to write. I would always suggest starting with that section, like actually start with the inter introducing my offer section and get down that easier copy first and then go back to the beginning of the page and write about your problem. That's interesting. I like that. So 
we want to start with the what well, I guess. I mean, this is something I've always done when it comes to writing sales pages, but there are, and and something I've come to realize is there always seems to be that introducing the academy or introducing the whatever the product or service is. So, is that where you suggest the two thirds start? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And like, I, 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 there's people usually say get the hardest thing out of the way. I'm completely opposite when it comes to sales pages. Start with the easier part and actually get momentum going. Once you've got words on your page, it's far more easier to keep going. I mean, you can't edit anything if there's nothing on your page to begin with, right? So start with the easier stuff, get writing, um, and then come back to the harder part, which is the top of the sales page. Awesome. I think there's a bit of a, um, there's a bit of a pattern, I feel, that's coming up in some of these episodes. So, you know, we had um, our mutual friend, Brittany Bailey, on the show, uh, who was who initially introduced uh, me and you. Yep. And she spoke about her dessert first method when it comes to writing emails, which was start with the call to action and then do the stuff. There you go. In the main. And, you know, I've never, I don't know why, but I've never thought about why that shouldn't apply to other things like sales pages. But I think that one nugget for everybody that's listening, like that one nugget is going to change the game for you guys, which is start with the the easy, you know, the the talking about your product stuff. Because we're all, we're all good at that, right? We can all list the features and benefits. Um, although that, that's maybe something to talk about there. It's the, the features versus benefits thing is oftentimes people will list out the benefits, but not so much. Sorry, oftentimes people will talk about the features and not so much the benefits. So do you have any hacks there for, for those types of people on, on how they can start to write more benefit-driven copy as opposed to feature-driven copy? Yeah, for sure. It's a great point. And a sales page definitely needs both. Um, you won't sell, you know, benefits, benefits sell for sure. You know, it's all the emotion sells and copy, but you need the features in there as well. You need both of them. So my suggestion is to have them in two separate sections, talk about the benefits. So why do I need this? How's it going to change my life using a lot of, so that really helps pull out the benefits. You know, you can do this so that your life is better in this way, what, whatever the example is. But yes, yeah, so have a benefit section first and then a feature section. So then you can go into the actual nitty gritty of your sales page, the modules, the Facebook groups, like the tangible things you're gonna get, but you do need to have both sections in your sales page. And I really am an advocate for separating them. When you kind of throw them both into a mixing pot, it gets really, really difficult to understand what am I, what am I actually getting? So separate them. So, um, from each other and it'll make your sales page a lot clearer for your reader. Mm, I, I couldn't agree more on that. You know, there's a conversation I had recently with, uh, I mean, I posted on my Facebook page cause it was just ended up in a ridiculous situation, uh, where I was speaking to a coach that was trying to sell me onto their, um, package and it was an expensive coaching package and all they did was sell me on the benefits but they never told me any of the features. And I'm a very logical person and I don't get strung up on the emotional benefits very much. Like I'm, mm -hmm. if you know, if I'm, if I'm buying into something, I tend to already know what the benefits are going to be. You need to tell me the features. Yeah. But there's often kind of a rule around, you need to talk about the benefits rather than the features. So it raises an interesting point. You're saying that you know, both are just as important as each other. Um, and the separating them is a really interesting point. What what mistakes do you think people make when they try and put them together? I think that it confuses people on what they're actually getting. Like, and I don't want to say benefits are fluffy by any means because they're not. They are so important. But when they get thrown in with the features, it's really hard to understand, okay, what am I actually walking away with? When I give you my money today, what am I going to get in return? Am I going to get... Um, you know, am I going to be jumping into that Facebook group? Am I going to be getting module one right away? Or do I have to wait? Um, you know, like, what am I actually going to walk away with? Um, it really, it is really important to rather than just to straight benefits. Yeah, got it. Cool. Do you think there's a most important part of a sales page? Or is every part you know, equal, of equal importance? Yeah, that's an interesting question. I feel like it's asking who's your favorite child? I really do. I feel like they're all so important. I feel like, like I'm thinking about this. 
and I'm saying like, you really need to nail that problem part, like that first one third. But then I'm like, well, I really need to know what's in the sales page. Like, what is the nitty gritty? And then I'm like, well, I'm not going to sell it if I if you haven't sold me on the guarantee and the FAQ. So, yeah, all that to say, I really do think it's it's all very important. Yeah, awesome. Um, when, when you this is something that I like to geek out on, which is why I'm asking the question, which is because I'm a funnel guy. I like to map out funnels on like a whiteboard and draw them out before I ever start to make things happen on on you know online. I can't I I'm someone that can't do my thinking on you know on the computer. I need to do it the same. Yep. So cool. This is where we can geek out. So when you're planning <laughs> a sales page, then like we've we've spoken about like the top third and the bottom two thirds and you know what needs to go into each. How, how do you map out? And I, I'm like proper geeky here. Like how how do you map out a sales page? In terms of are you so what's come into my head the reason that i'm asking this question because this is what's come into my head now that i understand some of the things that we've spoken about i'm like oh my god next time i write a sales page i'm going to get on the whiteboard i'm going to map out so i've got my top third my second third my third third and then i'm going to be like right all the problems i'm going to map out all the different ideas that can go in the top third and then all the logical stuff that can go in the second third how do you do it what, what's your kind of like drawing out planning phase when it comes to sales page yeah i mean it's essentially what you've said you you have nailed it um for me it's all in the research beforehand like right. before i even put pen to paper or start typing like i already know i are pretty much have everything written down already it's just a matter of placing it into the right sections so yeah like i said it's all research beforehand getting that voice of customer data is huge so i interview my clients uh, I interview like my clients' clients too. So people who they're selling to, to really try to get into their head and understand their pains, their problems, um, you know, their desires, all of that stuff. And I put it into a giant Excel spreadsheet is essentially what I do. So I get really specific on their problem, what they want, what's holding them back, uh, what they've tried before. Because that's something also that people really overlook is that this typically isn't the first time they've tried something. They've probably been in other courses or they've tried it themselves. So it's really important to understand the journey that they've already taken. So I've got that all mapped out. Um, so yeah, it's all in research beforehand in a giant Excel doc. And then once I get writing the day of, it's super easy for me just to run with the sales page. Got it. And when you're when you're writing, do you, are you ever thinking about the design of the sales page when you're writing? So I think again, this is a I mean a problem of mine is I'm I'm probably too much design focused, and my, by that I don't mean I'm good at design, but I'm always trying to probably think too much of how is this piece of text going to fit in here, and I need to make this text three lines to fit in here. Are you thinking about that, or are you thinking I need to get this wording right, and then we'll make it work from a design? Yeah. Like yeah, it, the, the second one, I'm always thinking copy first, and then I come in with my like kind of design goggles and figure out the placement of the copy. I'm never trying to fit design. Uh, I'm never trying to fit copy into design. I'm always trying to fit design into copy. Um, and when I do like a full launch for someone, I actually wireframe the sales page too. So I know that it's going to turn out exactly like I have in my head. So I send the wireframed document over to their designer. Nice. Well, one of the questions that I get asked a lot with some of my um, funnel funnel academy members is is around should I have and it's a super tactical question, but should I include a video on my sales page or not? Um, and just to, ca to to kind of pretext that is, I've I've personally received uh, lots of different advice on that subject. Some people saying you should, some people saying you shouldn't. So. I'm keen to hear what, what's your opinion on that. Yeah, I, I think it's a lot with marketing is testing. My audience might be different than your audience. I think it's a great thing to test. I would never say, no, they don't work because I've definitely seen them work. Um, and a video sales letter, you can do it multiple ways too. You could have it for sure at the very top as a video sales letter, but it's also really great to bring in video just to build that rapport, maybe a little bit down the page too, just to have, you know, we're obviously building connection being face to face here rather than no video. So um, there's a couple different ways that you could take look at it, but like everything, I would test it for sure. Yeah. Speaking my language, test <laughs> absolutely everything. Yeah, that's the answer, right? Yeah, totally. I'm going to shift the conversation actually a little bit away from sales pages for a second and, and towards 
uh, emails because I mean you're you're the launch expert here and and a massive part of launching is the email marketing right um i absolutely love your emails you're again like you're like your sales pages and i'm not just saying this because we're on a podcast together literally <laughs> your, your emails are some of the only ones that i actually read from a newsletter oh. perspective and i think what i love about them is how you mix like a bit of your life in with a bit of uh teaching so you teach people and you share, you know, what you're up to. Like I've been hiking this weekend type thing. So when it comes to your emails, do you have a strategy for that? Like, are you doing all of that sort of stuff on purpose? Or is it, you know, I just want to share some of my life and take some of the lessons from the things that are happening in my life. Like, tell me, tell me a little bit about those. Yeah, that's exactly it. I, again, it comes back to, I don't like reading boring copy. Why would anyone else like to? So I definitely like to pull in what's going on in my life. And I think about how I can relate it to like a marketing tactic or marketing advice. So yeah, hiking, it's funny, right before this, I was helping out on our cabin, like farm area, and the tractor was completely stuck. And I was laughing at myself. I'm like, this is such a good email. Like I'm probably going to talk about getting stuck in business and show a picture of our tractor, like halfway into the mud. So it's these things that are always going through my head. How can I take what's going on in my life and relate it to uh, some sort of marketing tip. Because what I'm doing in the meantime too is I'm really connecting with my audience. Like they love hearing these quirky stories from me. Um, Story-based emails, as we know, are so engaging. So, um, and then not only am I doing that, I'm showing them what is possible. Like people are also learning from me in all these story-based emails that I write. So yeah, um, I, I find that people often get uh, tip fatigue, really, like if you're just sending like the top four or five tips every week, they're not very exciting. They're great to throw in, but it's really those story based emails that are going to um, engage people. Awesome. I'd love to dive into this. So when you're going about your life, are you literally so the, the tractor example there are in your head? Are you going at that moment in time? Have you like trained your brain to be able to go? Oh my God, there's a business lesson in there. <laughs> or do we, you sit down on a you know a Thursday when you come to write your email and go, what's happened this week? Ah, the tractor. Yeah, I love that. We're totally nerding out on this. So I actually teach something called lifeisms, and that's essentially what that exactly is. I I have these little lifeisms. We all do, you do, everyone here has these lifeisms that happen every day, and they don't need to be exciting. Like Getting the tractor stuck isn't super exciting, but it will be in a story, right? Um, so every time I'm always, you know, if I've got um, usually on my phone in the notepad section, I just jot down something that happened, you know, something funny that happened at the grocery store or like this morning, I jot it down. So when I go to write my weekly email, I already know what I'm gonna say because the blank screen thing is horrible. Like I, it's, it's just a waste of time. I, there's no point in sitting down just thinking about last week because you're trying to push it and it probably won't make sense. So it's usually in the moment when something happens, I make a note of it in my phone. Okay. I like this. So you're taking moments of interesting things that happen in your life. So when you come down to write the email, you're like, ah, I could talk about the tractor today. I could talk about yep. the grocery today and the still and the, I, I've got um, friends, they, they call themselves the email marketing heroes, Robin Kennedy, and they call it uh, soft teaching. So it's okay. like uh, you take a lifeism and you then think of a, you know, a, something that you can teach from that lifeism, which, which is great. And I think, you know, um, you spoke about there, it, it helps to build that rapport with, with the people that are on your list. And it definitely does because, like I say, I, those emails are some of the only ones that I, I actually read because I think of, because it's the story and it's the it's almost like I know I'm going to get a tip from this but I feel like I want to learn about the story before I get <laughs> to the it, it's so true thank you I like I get responses from people saying I feel like we've like hung out before or been out for drinks together before and it's so funny it's amazing what story can do so I definitely encourage um, your audience to think about these lifeisms too and they don't need to be crazy things that's the whole point like you don't need a rags to riches story I actually sometimes even advise against it because it's not that relatable. It needs to be those really relatable everyday things that, that we're going through too, that we can kind of chuckle about together. Um, and that really helps you connect with your readers. Yeah. Uh, I, I totally agree with that. And so, something you might not be aware of is, and 
in in the UK, uh, the the industry is very different. I would say as the over in the US. I'm not sure what Canada is like, but over over in the US, the buying and storytelling I feel is very different to over here in the UK, especially yeah. in Scotland, which is where we are. Um, in that rags to riches do not work over here. Yeah. Like if, you, if you tell a rags to rich story here, there you're going to get slated for doing it. Whereas I think over in the US, it's something that is maybe a little bit more common. So I think um, what you say there about not, you don't always have to have a rags to riches story, I think is is really um, nice to hear because I think it's something that's kind of al almost always taught or maybe not necessarily taught, but people are like, mm, I feel like I need a rags to riches story, but you know what? I'm a middle-class person and I don't really have a rags to riches story and they try and force a rags to riches story. Yeah. And it's lying and it's unethical and it's not great. So it's, I'm, I'm glad that you have come on here and said, uh, you don't need a rags to riches story, folks. Just yep. think about the stuck tractor in the mud. Yeah, it makes you more relatable the more, you know, the everyday person, way more relatable. Yeah, awesome. Right, Danny, it is actually time for us to play a game. It's time for the game round. It's like the Highland Games, but on a podcast. Okay, the rules are simple. I have 10 cards here. It's a game called the five second rule. I don't know if you have ever heard of it. I have, yep. You have? Well, I've heard it on your podcast, but uh, okay, the five second are. rule also reminds me of the food thing, but yeah. I, I don't think that's what we're talking about. Okay. No, it's not. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, before the show, I asked Danny to prepare <laughs> 10 chicken nuggets. She's going to drop them on the floor. Uh, okay, so the rules are simple. I'll, I'll give you the rules, even though you might know them. I have 10 cards here with 10 different statements, and you have to give me an answer to those statements in five seconds. So there are going to be things like name three types of ice cream. You have to say strawberry, chocolate, vanilla within five seconds. If you are able to do that, you get a point. If not, you fail. Well, you don't fail. Wah, wah, wah. Oh, I've got one of those. Let's try this one. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, okay, are you ready? I'm ready. Let's do it. Okay. The, um, um, this one's interesting. Um, I don't normally give context to this, but because it's the first one, I'm going to give you a little bit of context. The answers to the to what I read out can literally be anything. So, yeah. Name three family pets. Dog, fish, cat. Nice, cool. See, some people can get confused there and go, well, I don't have three pets. So hmm. I'm glad you got that. One out of 10. Name three South American countries. Ooh, Brazil, Argentina, Chile. Nice, so you're fast. Name three things that you can see in the sky in daylight. Cloud, sun, bird. Nice, three out of three. Name three yellow foods. Banana, Mm, hot dog bun, mustard. Time, time is out. I'm afraid. Come on. Point, point seven seconds over. Name three ways to celebrate a birthday. Party, a jumping gym, or a. Oh, you're out of time. Got it. What's Name a jumping gym? Hilarious. Yeah. <laughs> I was just like, it must be a Canadian thing. <laughs> Name three musicals. Mm, um, oh gosh, my musicals. Time is out. I'm, afraid. I'm totally drawing a blank. You're not a musical fan. Clearly not. not. Name three phobias. Spiders, dark, um, being late. Yes, there we go. There we go. We're back on track. Yes. Name three wedding gifts. Dishes, blankets, um, coffee maker. Nice. Name three fads or crazes. Bell-bottom jeans, um, I, belly shirts. I was like, but what is bell? Thinking about clothes, bell bottoms. Yeah. <laughs> I'm thinking like about fads. Apple bottom. Is that the same thing? Um, I think it is actually. You know, like the '80s with the wide pants. Like, mm. I think they're coming back already. Yeah, I think they are. Um, okay, final one. Name three fam yeah. Name three famous people that use just one name. Cher, Oprah. Um, Time is out. Uh, I'm afraid. Right. Let's see. Jesus. 
what you got. One. one, two, three, four, five out of ten. That's, uh, it's a semi <sighs> score. We, we started that well. You got three out of three, then it went downhill slightly. That was a lot of fun. I'm still trying to figure out what a jumping gym is. A jumping gym. I've heard of a I jumping think that's what I said. I, I, you know, like the little like five year old birthday party with the. Uh, like a, we call that a bouncy castle. Yeah, I think we do too. Yeah. <laughs> that was fun. Out. Yeah. Awesome. Now we are going to run into the rapid fire round. Time for the rapid fire round. 10 questions, 10 answers, no context. Are you ready? Okay, cool. The rules are simple here. I'm going to read 10 questions. You've got to give me an answer without giving me context, although I might ask you for some context on, on them, in which you are allowed to give me context then. Okay. What is your favorite book? Harlan Coben. I absolutely adore Probably Tell No One. I haven't heard of that one. So mm. I'm going to ask a bit of context. Can we, what's, what's that he's about? a So he's a mystery, like suspense writer and totally fiction i actually always recommend like when people ask me how to write better i always recommend read fiction like of course you can read every business book out there which is great reading fiction really helps you um just write more casual um and helps with creativity as well for sure that's interesting i'm, I'm just going to touch on that because i have certainly not in my adult life ever read a fiction book yeah so what what can what how does a fiction book allow you to become better at writing? What? Yeah, I think it just kind of lets your brain go. Like, um, you know, and business books are great, obviously, but there's something about fiction that lets you, you know, it really helps with creativity and for writing as well. Like I said, it helps people not write as um, like structured. It really helps you write more conversational. Um, I mean, reading is is always good, right? It, we always hear reading makes you smarter, but yeah, specifically fiction books can really help with your writing. Right, challenge accepted. Mm -hmm. but, uh, that it's gonna it's gonna take me a lot to read a fiction book, but I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna do it by the end of the year. I All right, good for you. <laughs> What's your favorite word? Beauty. Nice. What is your most hated food? Hmm. Olives. Yes, I'm so. Olives are just the worst thing. Yeah. Honestly, I think they're disgusting. They, they don't do too much for me. No, I'm with you on that. Biggest pet peeve, either business or personal. Being late. That's probably why it came up in the phobia question. Mm, good one. Yep. What was your dream job as a child? I wanted to be a sports broadcaster. Nice. Mm -hmm. nice. Well, actually, talk, talking of which, uh, I was reading that you used, you're used to be an ex-professional hockey player. Which is yeah, cool. yeah. Back in the day, I uh, lived in Vienna, actually, so somewhat close to you. Um, cool. Lived in Europe and played. Yeah. I, I actually wanted to ask you the question: um, Were you one of those? Well, first of all, did you play ice hockey or normal hockey? Ice hockey, for sure. Wait, yeah. normal hockey? Is it normal hockey? Ice hockey? Not here. Not here. <laughs> Field so hockey think, is normal hockey. Uh, yeah. So oh, we, that's we would, hilarious. Uh, We'd say hockey and ice hockey. Um, oh yeah, that's funny. So uh, I wanted to ask you the question: um, Were you one of those like aggressive fighter ice hockey players? Because <laughs> the people that I see play ice hockey are crazy. Oh my gosh, I love that question. Um, I think I'm going to disappoint you by saying no, I wasn't. That's fair. Can I actually <laughs> ask a question? This is totally on a tangent, but something that's always interested me: Why? Why is there a culture of fighting in ice hockey? Why? Why is it like allowed? Why does it happen? Yeah, I mean, I think it's something that people debate. There's people who love it and people who hate it. Um, I, I, I definitely think it's part of the game. There's a, a lot of like momentum it comes into play. Um, you know, someone trying to get the team all fired up. Um, so yeah, I, I do agree that it is part of the game. Yeah, it's, it's interesting because it's, it's like the only sport that I've gone to physically watch in a stadium and been like, oh, I hope there's a fight today. <laughs> It's, uh, I love it. I think it's just, I think it's such a cool sport. I, I do too. I, I mean, there's the whole debate and it, it's sad, like post, you know, years down the line, you hear people getting, having injuries and long-term effects. So it, there's definitely a serious side to it that um, is sad for sure. But in the moment, I do think it's a great part of the game. It's interesting. I, I, I was completely oblivious to that. Yeah. But I remember my first ice hockey. I'm, I'm a 
football guy, like a soccer guy. But I remember my first ice hockey game. I was like, this is so cool. I didn't yeah. even know this, like, this world had existed because it's not really a big thing over here. It's certainly in Scotland, it's not really a big thing. Um, but saying that, the, the, for the people who it is a thing, it's a big thing. Like, it, yeah, yeah, like, for sure. Super, super fans. But it's not like a, you know, a widely consumed sport over here, which I, which I wish it was. Totally fair. Um, what's your favorite music genre? Country. Yes, thankfully. Someone else. Likes country <laughs> yeah? Country. Yay. yeah. That's I'm awesome. Like, I mean, uh, he's kind of more bluegrass, but my favorite guy right now is uh, Billy Strings. He's so, just Billy Strings. Billy Strings. Is he like a local guy? He's Nashville, Tennessee. Oh, yeah. okay. I'll have to look him up. Don't Shepherd. know him. Oh, yeah. Addicted. addicted. Um, what is your drink of choice? Beer. Nice. Craft, lager? Yeah. Craft. Nice, me too. Uh, are you a morning or night person? Morning. Nice one. And would you rather cuddle a baby panda or a baby chimpanzee? Ooh. Uh, how about a chimpanzee? That's yes. different. You are the first person to say anything <laughs> about a panda. So I am delighted. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's different, right? Yeah. I, I used to have the question. The question used to be panda or penguin. And nobody oh, it, it would penguin. definitely be penguin for me. I love penguins. There we are. You're the. I mean, I changed the question because nobody said penguin. I changed it to chimp. So I'm glad that you. Oh, that's hilarious. You're the outlier. Yeah. Both instances, amazing. Danny, what is one final parting piece of advice you'd like to share with the audience? Yeah, for sure. So advice, action breeds clarity. So what I mean, just do the thing. Like put your offer out there. Act on your ideas. I believe that. Um, success fiercely pursues decisiveness. So once your idea, your offer is, you know, out there, you can always make those tweaks. So yes, action breeds clarity. Action breeds clarity. Mm -hmm. Amazing. What a way to go. I have had, I've had a, a huge amount of laughs on this show. This has been amazing. Thank you so, so much fun. for coming on. Please tell everybody where they can read your amazing emails, go and check out your amazing website and all the fun things that you do. Yeah, I think you can find me on Instagram. That's kind of my main hub, uh, dannypage.com slash online. And from there, you can find all of my goodies, my website, my offers, everything's out there, freebies. And then you can get on my list that way. Yeah, and that is a page with da Danny, D-A-N-I-P-A-I-G-E. Yes, thank you. Got online. Okay. Yeah, I don't know if that's a UK thing or not, but um, it's been amazing. Everybody, go check out Danny. She is awesome. You'll love her stuff. If you enjoyed the show, you'll definitely enjoy um, hearing and seeing more from Danny. And if you'd like to get access to all those all those links in an easy place, just go to mrgavinbell.com forward slash podcast, and you will be able to see all the links to Danny's amazing stuff. As always, if you took something away from this show, then please take a screenshot as you're listening on your podcasting device. And uh, tag us on Instagram. So at Mr. Gavin Bell and at Danny Page, did you say? Uh, Danny Page dot online. Danny Page dot online. And uh, share your biggest takeaway. Share, tell us something that you took away from this show. Um, it's always much appreciated when you, when you tell us what you enjoyed. Danny, thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Gavin. That was so much fun. It's been a pleasure. And everybody that's listening, thank you so much for tuning in. I'll see you on the next one. Awesome. Cool. We're still live, but that is the podcast. Yay. Right that was a ton of fun. I enjoyed that. We've um, we've got quite a few comments here, which is which is great. Oh, that's fun. I can't see anything on my end. Oh, can you not? Okay. Well, let me read them out. So Andrew Morrison says, um, absolutely be authentic. People buy from people. Yep. Very true. Mar uh, Mauricio, Mar Mauricio says copy is king. Yes, it is. Um, Sam from Turnhead says, taking so many notes from this podcast. Hmm. Love it. Thank you. That's awesome. Awesome. Sam is amazing. She's in my coaching group. Um, Arihant says, is it live or just uh, uh, premiering? It is live, my friend. Richard says, hey. Um, Sam says, love Harlan Coben. Nice. Thank Actually, you. I think he's English. I think he's from your area uh, i have never heard of him so yeah i feel ashamed yeah that's all right <laughs> and andrew says thanks gavin and danny great to join another of gavin's linkedin lives it's a pleasure andrew thanks awesome. for tuning in yeah guys 
please, if you're watching on, um, if you're watching live or you're watching on the replay, please go check out Danny's stuff. It's um, it's great. I've worked with Danny personally. If you're thinking about doing a launch, get Danny involved in it. It's mm-hmm. going to make you more money. Simple as that. And um, Andrew, I am still live. I am still live. I just don't answer the comments <laughs> on the podcast so the people that are listening aren't freaking out going like, what's going on? Um, I'm still live though. But we are going to uh, wrap things up. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thanks so much for everybody that's tuning in live or the replay. Drop comments as if you're watching on the replay. Let us know where you're listening from. Uh, and I will be back here on Monday, I believe, with another episode. So we'll see you all 